Um, might, might maybe just turn it down just a tad. I think there's a little bit of reverberation. Maybe that caused the feedback. Thank you. All right. Well, let's um, move on then to the um, third commandment this evening in Exodus chapter 20. Again, I can't uh, repeat everything that we've seen in every sermon, although we'll try to review just a bit the things that we have seen. Uh, and I've been trying to do that as we've been kind of moving along. Uh, this, I believe, is what our Lord tells us quite plainly. This was the covenant He made with His people when He brought them out of Egypt. The author to the Hebrews tells us there wasn't anything wrong with the standard. The problem is with the people. They did not continue in my covenant. The Lord says, and I did not care for them. So he makes a new covenant. And in that new covenant, he writes this law upon their hearts, giving them the desire to love as the Lord called them to love, which is what he has given to us if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. So having looked at the first and second commandments, let me simply read for you the third commandment which is in verse 7. The Lord says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening, particularly that we may know how to love the Lord as he would have us to love him. Remember, he knows what he wants. And he's told us what he wants. We don't have to guess what's pleasing to God. This, this, is, this is what is pleasing to him. So again, just by way of quick review, God did give his law to a redeemed people. We saw that uh, originally. Those he had saved from slavery out of Egypt. But a people that were largely unconverted people. And we know that because most of them died in the wilderness under God's judgment because they did not believe God. They were not able to enter into the land. The people of God wandered for 40 years until that whole generation died off. So most of them did not know him and ultimately perished. Now maybe that's why in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Lord couches the language of these commandments in largely negative terms because they were more likely to break them than to keep them. And we need to understand that as far as motivation, there are two kinds of motivation that a person may have. I'm sure there are several others, but two main motivations to keep these commandments. There is a love of gratitude when you believe that the Lord has done something kind for you. But that gratitude can only take you so far. When it wears off, you will return to the way you were. I think Peter refers to it as the sow that's wallowing in the mire and you clean it off and take it out but because its nature isn't changed it eventually returns to wallowing in the mire again but then there is that love that is created by the holy spirit that makes you want to do what the lord calls you to do um, because you now love him and because you now love the law you love his standard you love what is right and you want to do it now, all of these that he brought out of Egypt certainly had the first kind of motivation. They were thankful that God had delivered them, although we also recognize there were many times when they wanted to turn back to Egypt, so even that seemed to be relatively weak. But there were very few that had this second kind of motivation. Well, in the New Covenant, God gives his law to a people, to us, who are both redeemed and we weren't redeemed out of the grip of an earthly king, at least I don't think we have any of us here, but out of the devil's kingdom, out of the devil's power. And in the new covenant, he's also converted us. Our hearts have been renewed by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. And now by his spirit, we love him and we love his ways. Now the law still teaches us what not to do. And we still need to know what it is uh, that we ought not to do because we have remaining sin in our hearts. We still want to do things that are wrong. We still need the negative, so to speak. But now it's what it tells us to do that interests us more than what not to do, I think. How to love God. How to love the one who has loved us from all eternity and who sent his son into the world 
uh, to live and to die for us. So what is it that he wants us to do in order to love him? How should we love him? Well, first of all, he wants us to receive him as our God. And what he means by that is to love him most of all, far more than any other, and to devote ourselves fully to him, to look to him and to trust him alone to meet all of our needs and to satisfy the desires of our heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, which doesn't mean that, Lord, if I... If I uh, you know, deceive you, as it were, into making you think I love you most of all, you're going to give me all those, those earthly things that I want. But if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give Himself to you. He should be the desire of your heart, and He will meet all of your needs. So that was the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. God shall be your God, and you will love Him most of all. Secondly, He wants us to worship Him to love Him and to serve Him in the way that is pleasing to Him more narrowly in our public worship, what we're doing here right now, reading and hearing His Word proclaimed, praying to Him, singing songs that honor Him for what He has done and express love and gratitude for His mercies, remembering the death of His Son for us and for our salvation as we celebrate His table, which is what we do in the morning, and remembering his resurrection from the dead by spending the day with him, the day of his resurrection, and by meeting together to worship him and to fellowship together. So we are to uh, worship him in narrowly as he calls us to worship him, but also more broadly in the way that we live, seeking to honor him in everything that we do by seeing things as he tells us they really are by doing the things that he tells us to do, to follow what he says and not what the world says or does. Remember, Paul told us that we are to present ourselves to God as living sacrifices, that we are not to be like the world, but we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, which only happens when we read and study the Word of God with the Spirit of God as our guide. Remember, the Spirit is the one who illumines the pages of Scripture and shows us the divinity of this Word, shows us how precious it is and gives us the desire to want to conform to it. This is what we are to be conformed to, not the world, but God's Word. Now, these first two commandments, as I said before, really summarize everything that the Lord wants us to do. Love Him with all your heart. Serve and worship Him with your whole life. This is the complete surrender that Eric Little was referring to as, as to what the Christian life is really all about. Remember on his deathbed, he says, it's complete surrender. That's what the Lord calls us to. And that is the path of blessing. Now, as I've said before, the commandments that follow simply spell out this a bit more fully. So this evening, let's consider the third commandment to learn about how the Lord wants us to love Him further. Now, this commandment tells us at least two things, that we are to use His name reverently and that we are to keep the promises that we make to Him. Actually, the second one is the primary one. So let's consider, first of all, what the commandment actually calls us to do. What does it mean? And secondly, why the Lord says we should do as He calls us. So first of all, what does this commandment call us to do? God says in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now it's interesting because I think when we read this commandment, we actually tend to think it means more of how we are to use His name to make sure that we don't use it as a swear word, that we don't blaspheme, and, and that is included. But if we understood how this was literally translated, we might see a bit more clearly what it is that he's really saying here primarily. Literally translated, we could do it this way. You shall not lift up the name of the Lord your God to vanity or to falsehood. That's what it means, what's what vain means, emptiness or falsehood or a lie. 
And it means what the Lord said in our meditation this evening in Leviticus 19.12. He says, you shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Now to swear to something is to attest to the truth of something or the falsity of it. To take an oath to the fact that something actually did happen or didn't happen. And to do it, calling God to bear witness. You know, we all used to have a practice in our courts of swearing in a witness by having them place their hand on the Bible and requiring of them an oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Now, if you took such an oath, then you bound yourself to tell the truth, and you better tell the truth if you have any fear of God in your heart at all. Otherwise, you're calling God to bear witness to a falsehood or to a lie. And in so doing, you are lifting up his name to a falsehood, and you are breaking this commandment. This commandment requires that when we take an oath, that we are sincere in that oath, when we call God to bear witness to what we're saying, that that is the truth, what we're saying. Now, this commandment also requires that we be sincere in the vows that we take. Now, some of us here may never have been called to testify in court in this way, but many of us have taken vows. If you're married, you've actually taken a vow, you've made a vow to love and to cherish your spouse for your entire life, no matter what difficulties you essentially have to face. If you become a member of a church, certainly it's true of this church, you've actually sworn oaths and made vows. I know that sounds rather serious, but that is in fact what we have done by becoming members. You've called God to bear witness to certain affirmations, certain things that you say you believe to be true. First of all, that you believe the Bible to be his word that shows us the only way of salvation. Secondly, that the triune God is the only true God and that Jesus is the Son of God who came into this world in our nature. And thirdly, that you have repented of your sins, all of your sins, and you are trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation alone. Now think about those three things for a minute that you're affirming. You believe the Bible is his word. The triune God is the only true God, that Jesus is the Son of God who came into this world in our nature. You have repented and you're trusting him alone. You can't be a believer unless you affirm these things. And so basically when you, you join, you're, you're, you're basically affirming before the Lord and before witnesses that you believe these things to be true. Now, when you became a member, you also made two vows the first one is, and this one has to do with the spiritual warfare that we've just been looking at, that you will forsake this world, resist the devil, and put your sinful desires to death, that you may serve your Lord and live the life that he calls you to live. Isn't that what the Lord calls all of us to do as his people? And then secondly, that as a part of this local body, you will, be, you will faithfully worship and serve the Lord in this body and submit to its leadership and listen to it if he brings correction to you if you should go astray. In other words, if your shepherds, under shepherds of Christ come to you and point out some sin in your life, and by the way, we should all be doing that for one another, you will listen. You will listen to what they have to say. Now again, these things are merely a summary of what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to believe in Jesus. This is what it means to repent. This is what it means to follow Jesus. It's what all Christians believe and what they do. And when you take these oaths and you make these vows, you're simply saying that you intend to take these things seriously. Now the point is, as in the case of the marriage vows and in the case of the uh, membership vows, if you have made these vows, this is what you need to do. Loving the Lord means devoting yourself to Him, living as He calls you to live, and keeping your promises 
to him. And of course, you can't love him unless you first repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're never going to do that unless you believe the Bible is his word and this is the only way of salvation. So let's pause here just for a moment and ask the question, how are we doing so far? You know, each of us should really carefully consider before the Lord whether or not we are loving him as he calls us to love him, whether or not we're doing what we promised we would do. The Lord wants us to keep those promises. And actually, remember that if we're going to take up the cross of Christ, if we're going to come into the kingdom of God, we come in with certain requirements upon us. These things would be required of us even if we hadn't taken the, this, this particular oath. But having taken that oath, or that vow, I should say, we should take it even more seriously. We have bound ourselves to follow the Lord, which is what all of us as Christians want to do. But there is another way we can break this commandment, one, again, that we're all too familiar with, and that is when we use His name in a way that dishonors Him. When we lift up His name and treat it as something less than worthless, something that is really profane. We profane the name of the Lord. And by the way, we do need to remember that when we're, when we're dealing with the names of the Lord, we're not just talking about a name that is somehow separate or abstract from God Himself. It's kind of like if I, if I took your name or if you took my name and you used it in a certain way, that name represents me. And when you treat my name that way, you're treating me that way. And the same thing is true with God's name. When, when you use His name, and you treat it a certain way, you are treating him that way. Now, how can we do that, or how, how is it that it can be done? Well, it, it happens when we drag God, as it were, down by using his name as a common swear word. Or when we hear other people use his name irreverently as a swear word, or blaspheme him, or use, again, as terms of expression or surprise or whatever, and we are not offended by the fact that they have just done that to our Lord. We should be offended when we hear his name misused. Now again, think about this for a moment. When you love somebody, you want them to be treated well, don't you? You, you respect them and you want other people to do the same. And it offends you when somebody says something about them that isn't true or if they make them the brunt of their joke or if they're critical against them. That offends you, and it should, because you care about the person who's being dragged down. But shouldn't your love for the Lord, shouldn't my love for the Lord make us feel the same way, or even more so, with regard to when His name is misused, when He is mistreated, because we love Him so much more than anyone else. Remember, the first commandment is to love God most of all, it's really a summary of what it means or what the Lord is saying when he says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. If you love him that much, when you see him dishonored, it is going to offend you. It's going to hurt you. You can't be unmoved by it. You can't be unaffected. So is that how you feel? when you hear God's name or the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, used to curse at someone or to express surprise and alarm and amazement at something? Does it, does it offend you? Does it make you angry? Now, not with a vindictive anger, like I'm going to you know, seek revenge on you, but with a righteous anger that desires to see that wrong righted and the Lord actually honored. Isn't this something that you should want not to hear this? Are you taking steps not to hear it? not to hear the one, the name of the one who is most precious to you used in, in that way. Now, love dictates that we stand up for the honor and reputation of the one whom we love. And by the way, God reveals himself, and, and here's, here's this principle expanded just a bit more broadly. God reveals himself by more than just names. He reveals himself in many other ways. Whatever the Lord or however the Lord reveals himself this commandment tells us that we need also to respect and honor him in that as well. So we should be offended under other circumstances, such as when people attack his creation, 
by saying that it's just a random event that accidentally <laughs> happened in the course of time and matter, attributing all this design to evolution. That should be offensive to us. When they attack his word by claiming that it's, it's the ramblings of, of superstitious people, it's a collection of myths and legends, it's a set of outdated social norms that may have been fine then, but we've outgrown those. Uh, when they attack his justice by calling him vindictive or capricious in you know, whom he punishes and, and whom not. When they attack the, the order that the Lord has created in, in his world, in the authorities that he has established. Or when they attack his moral commandments by saying that, well, if you're going to require this, God's a killjoy, he's a prude. We should be offended when we hear those things because God deserves to be treated better than that. When we attack anything that is connected to Him, we are attacking God. And when people attack those things, they're attacking Him. And love dictates that we should be offended and that we should take action. So again, let's think about this. Do you love God? Do you love His name? Do you love His truth? Do you love his works? Do you love his, his ways? This is what this commandment calls you to do. And if you know him, you know that he is worthy to be treated with the greatest love and respect. Certainly, if you have the Spirit of God in your heart, that is what you want to do. And you know that this is right. You know this is good even if you didn't have it spelled out in Scripture. Now secondly, let's consider why we should keep our promises and treat his name and everything else by which he reveals himself, why we should treat it respectfully and reverently. Now the first reason should always be because we love him. And that's what the new covenant is all about. That's what the spirit of God produces. We see, we know, we've experienced God and his love we, we know of his person, we know of his character, we know of his being, we know that he's worthy, worthy to be loved and treated this way. And we want to treat him this way, we want to love him. I mean, what he has done for us moves us to love him. His spirit compels us to love him, but particularly his character, because the spirit of God gives to us that understanding, that view, that sight of the beauty and the holiness of God that should compel us to draw our hearts out to Him. But the second is there as well, and it's incorporated in this commandment, and that is fear. Fear of what God says He'll do to those who dishonor Him in this way. Now Solomon told us, and it's still a part of New Covenant experience, in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear should always be a part of our Christian experience. Now, as I've said, he has incorporated an element of this in this commandment, something that should make us fear. In verse 7, after he says, you shall, uh, well, he says here, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, we do need to understand I do believe that means something different for the unbeliever versus the believer. Now he certainly means that he's going to hold everyone accountable, not only for what they do, but also for what they say, although speaking is certainly an action, so maybe there's really no distinction there. Uh, the Lord actually tells us that on the day of judgment that he is going to hold everyone accountable, not just for their actions, but for their words. Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. By the way, I do believe, because sometimes this, this can make us a bit concerned, does that mean that all the things that I said that I should have said in the past, God's going to bring them up on the day of judgment, well, I do believe that if we've trusted Jesus, that he has cleansed us and washed us and will present us blameless before him on that day. So I believe this is referring to people who have not repented. But I want you to notice that Jesus says our words are what are going to justify us. Our words will condemn us. 
And Jesus explained what he meant in the verses that came immediately before these in verses 34 and 35. And notice again the context. You brood of vipers. Obviously, he's not speaking to his people. He's speaking to, well, at least not his new covenant people. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. So how is it that our words will justify or condemn us? Well, our language reflects what is in our hearts. It shows what we really are. Now, if we hate the Lord, we'll misuse his name. We won't, you know, we will lift it up to vanity. We will make promises. We won't keep them. We'll, we'll swear oaths and lie. We'll, we'll make vows and we'll break those vows and we'll dishonor the Lord. And we won't care what other people say or how they use his name. But if we love him, we will care and we will speak reverently of him. Now, the point again is this, is the Lord is one day going to call into account those who dishonor him. The way they used his name will be one of the things that actually speaks out against them on the day of judgment and prove that they didn't know him or love him if they have dishonored him in this way, if that has been the practice of their lives. But now that's how it applies to the unbeliever. What about those of us who actually love him? Should we also be afraid of this as well? Well, we do need to be afraid, but as I said before, not for the same reason that those who are outside of Christ should be afraid. Now, we should be afraid at one level because if this is the pattern of our lives, if we, again, break our vows, lie when we're saying that we're telling the truth, use His name in a way that dishonors Him, we can prove in the end that we really don't know Him at all. So that should make us to be afraid of that. And that has to do with assurance. But we should also be afraid of what the Lord will do to us even if we do love Him but have fallen into this particular sin. Now, this is a good kind of fear. It's the kind of fear that a child has of, of his parents, a respect of what this one who is an authority over me and who loves me and who is committed to my walking in the right path, what they will do to me. The Lord will not destroy us. He loves us too much to do this. Jesus already died. He already took... God's wrath upon himself for the sins that we have committed, that debt has already been discharged. He won't destroy us. He won't condemn us. But he will discipline us. If he doesn't spank us in some way, we don't actually even belong to him. But if we do belong to him, he will discipline us. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 12, 6, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. You know, I think that idea of scourging, that's, that's a pretty severe word. But the Lord will do what is necessary. He goes on to say in verse 7, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now again, that's an act of love. That's not an act of judgment. It's an act, discipline is an act of love. It's meant to correct, not to punish. And his spankings, his discipline isn't always easy. It may begin light, it may be like a slap on the wrist, but the deeper we go into sin, the further we try as it were, and on some occasions it certainly is possible for believers to do this, the further we get away from him, the more intense his discipline will become. He will only let us go so far but no further, and he will bring us back to himself because he loves us. God, he loves us so much that he will do whatever has to be done to break us away from our sins so that that sin will not destroy us. Now, again, you who are parents know, either from past experience or present experience, sometimes you have to go to great lengths to get your children to give up the things that could ruin them. They don't understand that. They want it. They think it's fine. I want it. That's all I need. I'm just going to do it. But you realize that behavior is, is not going to help them, and so you, you do what is necessary to get them to stop. And you who aren't parents yet will one day learn that you have to do this if you love your children. Well, God loves you if you are his child. 
if you belong to him, and he will do what is necessary also to keep you on the path. And that is a good thing. Without that discipline, we would go astray and we would perish. The Lord will bring us back. Now, there is, of course, an alternative to having to undergo this discipline. And the alternative is this. Don't go off the path. <laughs> Love him and honor him. Devote yourself to him. Live as he calls you to live. Speak the truth. Don't bear witness to a lie. Don't confirm a lie. Don't swear an oath to a lie. When you make a vow, keep your vow to the Lord. When you use his name, use it reverently. And if you do this, not only will you not see the fatherly displeasure, but you will see his fatherly pleasure. You'll see his face of blessing rather than his hand of discipline. So may the Lord help us to simply listen to the law of God and yield to the Spirit as he encourages us, as he motivates us, as he moves us to go that direction. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit or yield to the Spirit. The Spirit of God wants us to go the right way, and this is the right way. This is the way. Walk in it, so yield to it and resist going off the path. Stay on the path, and you will experience the Lord's blessing. But again, thankfully, if we do get off, He's still there, and He'll still make sure that we get back on, and we should be thankful for that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a, in a moment of prayer, and let's thank the Lord that He loves us enough to show us the right way and to make sure that we stay on that right path.